Hey, thanks for the handover, Daniel, and good afternoon, everyone, or wherever you're tuning in from. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Starnes, and I'm a software engineer at Neo4j, and I work on the GraphQL team. Um, for the most part of my professional career, I've been working with GraphQL, um, and specifically securing GraphQL APIs. So you can find me online uh, on Twitter, and I tweet about GraphQL stuff. Um, and there wasn't a, there's another Dan stance there, so you do have to put the one on the end of it. And then you can also find some of my core projects on GitHub at slash Dan Stance. So what's in this talk? So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of Neo4j GraphQL. Um, I'm going to assume that you've played around or you've watched some of the cool talks, such as Daryl today. He, he, he gave a really cool talk about Gra Neo4j GraphQL. And then we're going to go into a little bit more detail on authentication on how you can authenticate requests coming into your GraphQL API. Um, and that will include JSON web tokens and then using a new feature that we have called the OGM. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about authorization. And then we're going to take an even deeper dive here. And we're going to talk about some of the specifics uh, Neo4j GraphQL has to offer, such as where, allow, and bind. So let's get started. So what is Neo4j GraphQL? As I said, I'm going to just skim over this briefly. But let's just take a little look. So here's the library, and it sits in the middle here. And it's a translation library. So your, your clients make GraphQL requests, and then the library translates that GraphQL into Cypher. And if you have a look at this slide here, we can see that you define some type definitions. So here's a movie, and it's got a title and an IMDB rating. And then you can make queries to that, to, to that library uh, using GraphQL query language as well. So here we're selecting some movies with the title and the IMDB rating. So that's enough for what is Neo4j GraphQL. Let's dive into a little bit more about auth uh, and GraphQL specifically. So if you've ever used GraphQL before and you've tried to secure your API, you may have come across so many options out there. And it's very difficult to get started securing your graph. Uh, not only that, it's quite there's a lot of anti-patterns out there. So for example, you could have the authentication in every single resolver, which means that it's really slow for your API. Or it means that you will fetch data and then filter it inside of your resolver, which again is not really performant. So at Neo4j GraphQL, what we decided to do is bake in auth into our library. And when I say the term auth, what I mean is authentication and authorization. And then I'll split the differences up shortly in the, in the slides. So as Neo4j GraphQL produces a single Cypher statement, we can bake the auth into that Cypher statement meaning that you're still only calling the database once, and it's only one round trip to the database. Ultimately, this leads to better performance. So auth in GraphQL. Before we get started, I just want to show this data model. Um, and this is produced by a cool tool called arrows.app. And there's actually going to be a talk later on today um, on, on this. But here we have users and posts and comments, and they're all related to each other. So we're going to use this throughout the talk. And the GraphQL schema for this is going to look a little bit like this. So we're going to have our type user. And that's going to have an ID and a name. And then we're going to have some posts. And then here you'll see the creator and the comments. They have a relationship annotation on them. Um, and then as well as that, we have some comments as well. So we're going to come back to some relationships shortly. Um, and we actually use GraphQL direct directives um, which is what this relationship is. But we're going to use an auth one as well. So let's get started with authentication. So before you can actually authorize people to do things, you're going to need to authenticate them. And in Neo for j GraphQL, we, we go for the approach of a JSON web token. So here's a JSON web token. And it's actually a HTTP request in the bottom here. Um, and you can see the authorization header and it's uh, encoded um, string there in the header. And if you was to decode this, it would give you this JSON object here. So we have a sub property, which we're going to be using throughout the talk. But then we also have name and then some other expiry values as well. But they're not so important for this talk. So because it's just a JWT, you can authenticate users however you like. You could have a um, service sitting in front of your API that does all the authentication for you and then passes a JWT along. Or you could have a custom resolver inside of your GraphQL API that does the authentication in there. And the latter approach is what we're going to dive into today. So introducing the OGM. And this is 
a way that you can authenticate users using your Graph API. The OGM can also be used for other things as well, such as migrations or custom scripts or any place that you need to interact with the database. So let's just dive a little bit deeper into what is the OGM? How can I use it? So here's some Node.js code. The Neo4j GraphQL library is written in, in TypeScript and, and it's uh, supposed to be used in a Node.js environment. So the code examples here are gonna be either GraphQL or simple um, pseudocode Node.js. So you have to install the Neo4j GraphQL OGM library. It's separate from the Neo4j library itself and then you import the OGM class. Then what you can do is you can define your type definitions. And these are the exact same type definitions as we used earlier on. And what I've done is, is I've just stripped them down for simplicity. So here's a reminder of the graph that we're using. Then what you do is you construct your OGM, and you pass in the type depths and the driver. And then finally, you can access the model method on the OGM. So here we're retrieving the user um, from, from the OGM. So you may be thinking, okay, I've got the I've got the model. What can I do with it? Well, the model has lots of methods on it. So you can create, you can find, and you can update, and you can delete. And these methods are calling the GraphQL APIs methods. So what that means is when you use the OGM, you have all of the type safety of the GraphQL API, and you get all of the resolvers and all of your custom logic as well. So with this, we know that now we can interact with the database using a more a familiar approach for most developers, you don't have to write custom cipher, and also you don't have to perform GraphQL queries. With this, what it means is we can use that to authenticate users in our API. So I've gone back to the schema here that we had at the beginning. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna collapse it down a little bit just for simplicity. And then I'm gonna add a custom mutation. So this is a mutation in GraphQL and we can ex essentially extend the functionality of the auto-generated library. And here I'm saying I want there to be a function in this API called sign in, and it's going to have a username and a password arguments, and it's going to return the string. And the string represents the JWT. So let's have a look how we can actually implement this. So we have our user model, and now we've defined a sign in function. And again, this is just pseudocode just for the purposes of this example, but you see that we're using the OGM on the first line of this function to find the user. And then we're doing some checks, and then we're going to return a signed JWT. Then what we can do is we can use the Neo4j GraphQL class, and this is the class that uh, Daryl had been using in his previous talk today. And then you can define the resolvers inside that class and extend the custom functionality. What this means is that when you start your Neo schema, you'll, you'll have not only will you have all of the goodness of our auto-generated logic, but you also have now your custom signing mutation that your clients can use to sign in or sign up or, or whatever you else when you, you want to extend. So now we know how to authenticate users and our users can attach that returned JWT to the request. Let's now look at how we can authorize users to do certain actions. So here again, just to remind you of the graph that we're using, we have users, posts, and comments. And this is the first look at the GraphQL directive. So you've seen the directive before on fields. So the creator and comments have the relationship directive on a field. But now what we're going to be doing is extending the post and give it an auth on the top level of this type. And I'm using the extend keyword here because the auth directive is quite, um, it has a lot of depth to it. So what this means is if you use extend, it keeps your schema a little bit clean. You, you know where the properties are. Um, and you can read the schema a lot easier. And you can almost put the auth aside when you just want to worry about the data model. So I've extended the post type and I've added the auth directive and I've opened up a rules array. So you can use the rules as like a big or, um, and I can define many rules for many different things. But here we're going to do a simple one. So if you had users, posts, and comments in your API, you're probably not going to want anyone to create a post because that would just be ridiculous. So the first rule we're going to implement is a create operation. So anytime someone is going to go and create a post, we're going to make sure that they're authenticated. And what this will do is it will look at the headers coming into the GraphQL server. It will look for the bearer token, and then it will make sure that that JWT is valid. So this JWT is coming from the custom resolver that we defined just a few slides ago. So that's how we can authenticate, uh, check that people are authenticated and we know how to authenticate people as well.
But things get a little bit more complicated, especially if you have a production app, for example, you want certain people to be able to do certain things and so on and so forth. So let's have a look in more detail. I'm gonna look at the where key. So the where is part of the auth directive and it's a key that you specify in the rules array. And essentially what it does is it automatically appends predicates to the generated cipher query. So let's have a look in more detail. Here is a subgraph of our graph that we've been using. And we're just gonna look at users posted posts for the time being. So we've got Bob and we've got Jane, and they both have loads of posts. And in this hypothetical example, we're gonna say that actually Bob can't see Jane's posts and Jane can't see Bob's posts. So essentially we wanna lock this API down to only the requestee. What we can do is that we can take the subset of the schema here. So I've just stripped some stuff down, still using the same model. And then we can add the auth directive onto the post. Now what we can do is we can add the where key into here. So now what we're saying is every time somebody interacts with a post and where applicable, we're gonna add a predicate to the query where the creator is equal to the jwt.sub property. So inside this where object, we are traversing the relationship defined as the second field on the post. And then we're, we're using dot notation um, in the string to pluck a value out of the JWT. Now, you may have noticed that in a few slides back, I used the auth directive and I specified the operations array. And in the previous slide, I didn't. So here I'm just diving a little bit more detail into all the operations that you can specify with the auth directive. But however, if you don't specify any operations, then it's gonna to default to all of the applicable operations. So for example, if you was using the where, it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply it for a create operation because there's no, there's no where involved in a create operation. So what we can do is when Bob queries the API for posts and gets the content, this query is gonna get generated. But when we add the where onto the post, what's gonna happen behind the scenes within the generated cipher on the back end is that a predicate is gonna get uh, attached to the query. So we're gonna say where all of the users and where the user ID is equal to Bob's ID. So this is great because it means that uh, Bob, when he's querying the API, he doesn't have to worry about uh, adding any predicates to the query. He's just gonna get the posts that the server has set up uh, for him to see. So the next key I wanna look at is allow. So where is cool, um, but the problem is with where is that it's, um, a user is going to request something and there's going to be a uh, predicate that's going to automatically be attached to that generated cipher. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that, that's bad, depending on how your app is. Maybe, for example, Bob does want to see Jane's posts, but Bob, do, Bob shouldn't edit James, Jane's posts, for example. So you might want to take away where at that point and then introduce something like allow and also bind that I'm going to dive a little bit more deeper into. So here's allow and it enables specific users to perform specific actions. So we have Bob and he posted a post and Jane commented on that post. But the problem here is that Jane, she's a troll and she commented something that was a little bit nasty on Bob's post and Bob wants to be able to remove it. So let's see how we can do this. So firstly, let's see how we can just let Bob delete his own posts. It's fairly straightforward. So we have our schema that we defined earlier. I've made it a little bit smaller here. And then we're gonna extend the comment now because we're talking about comments. And then we're gonna say on a delete operation, let's make sure that we allow the creator of that comment to delete it. That's straightforward. But now we wanna enable Bob to also delete Jane's posts. So what we can do is we can extend this allow, expand this allow, add an or in there, add our original predicate, which was allow the creator to delete their own post. But now we can also say, we're gonna traverse the relationships and say, allow the post creator to also delete that comment. So now Bob can delete Jane's nasty comment, Jane can delete her own comments, and Bob can delete his own comments as well. Now let's look at bind. So bind's an interesting one. Um, allow has mainly been used for reading. Uh, where's mainly used for reading but bind is helpful when you're editing the graph. 
So it enables you to enforce equality between a JWT property and a target node property. So, that, so I've got the subgraph here and users posted posts. And Bob, he posted a post and Jane, oh, hang on a minute, something doesn't look right here. Bob posted a post for Jane. That's not what we want. And we want to be able to stop this. Uh, how can we stop Bob from posting for Jane? This is where bind comes into play. So we take our schema and we extend our post type and we add an array of rules into there. And then we say that the on the create operation, let's make sure that we bind the creator's ID to the JWT sub property. And again, this is all going to happen within one Cypher query. So if, if for example, Bob did create a post, but he specified that the creator should be Jane, we're going to throw out the operation, we're going to cancel the transaction, and that post is never going to be created. However, if Bob is a good actor and he is creating a post for himself, it's going to go through fine, and that's going to be inserted into the database. So just again, bind is to enforce equality between a JWT property and the target node property. So you can use this for create, update, delete, disconnect. And then finally, the last key I want to look into is roles. So maybe you have rule-based access control in your schema and you want to specify certain roles should be able to do certain things. So here we have a user, and I'm going to add a hypothetical uh, property on this user called the recovery code. And this could be something that's quite secret. Maybe the user should only view this, or also maybe admins should be able to view this to help the user if they get locked out of their account. So what we can do is we can add the auth directive here and you may notice that we're actually adding the auth directive on a field this time. Before, we've been adding it on the type, so on the user type or the post type or the comment type, but now it's on the field. So this is how fine-grained you can get with the auth directive. And I've opened up an array of rules, and I'm saying uh, allow, and I'm going to put a big or in there, and I'm going to say allow the admin to, to view a certain people's, certain person's recovery code. And again, because there's no operations here, we're just going to specify this for any single operation that happens. But then also, the user may also want to view their own recovery code, so we can add that in there as well. We can say that let's, but let's uh, allow the ID to be equal to the JSON Web Token ID, the sub property, sorry. So let's recap on what we've just learned. So we've learned that where you can automatically append predicates, allow enables specific users to perform specific actions, Bind enable, enforces equality between the JWT property and the target node property, and then roles, which allows you to add rule-based access control to your schema. So with that, before I summarize, I just want to mention that we are hiring on the Neo4j GraphQL team. Um, so if you go to neo4jgraphql.com slash careers, and you have a look around for the GraphQL side, you can apply to the job. If this is something that interests you, we are uh, we have open source on GitHub, so you'll be working uh, with the team on open source software, um, helping the community grow. So thank you very much for tuning into my talk. As I said, I'm Dan Starnes. I'm a software engineer on GraphQL at NFJ, and you can find me on Twitter at Dan Starnes one and on GitHub at Dan Starnes. And with that, a little bit early, but let's pass back over to the host. Thank you.